Well, I wanna bring a message today titled, How to Sing the Lord's Song in This Strange and Foreign Land. Now, don't worry, I'm not gonna teach you how to sing this morning, uh, but following Jesus is about learning, isn't it? Being a disciple of Jesus is a learning experience. So following Jesus is about learning His heart, His ways. And that means that we're on a lifelong, grace-filled journey of discovering how to, how to follow Jesus. And today I wanna speak to you from Psalm 137. And I have to warn you, Psalm 137 is not the most life giving, you know, faith filled portion of Scripture in the Bible. In fact, it's quite sombre. It's a moment where, where the people of God are having this, this cry of lament about their situation and they're crying out to God. And so in Psalm 137, verse one, it says this, by the rivers of Babylon. Do you remember that song? By the rivers of Babylon. <laughs> By the rivers of Babylon, there we captives sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion, the city God imprinted on our hearts. On the willow trees in the midst of Babylon, we hung up our harps. For there they, for there they who took us captive demanded of us a song with words. And our tormentors who made a mockery of us demanded amusement saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And the people of God responded, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange and foreign land? You know, Psalm 137 is not for the faint of heart. The people of God were taken into captivity in Babylon and prophets had pre-warned them as they began to lose their way, lose their focus, lose their perspective. They were worshipping other gods, falling into sin. And then in a moment, everything that they loved, everything they enjoyed and built was taken from them and destroyed. In a moment, the wind knocked out of them, their air sucked out of them. They were sent into exile. The people of God found themselves in captivity, in exile. And in this Psalm, we find them grieving their loss, reflecting on what was, enduring their pain and, and torment and asking deep questions. And as I looked into, into, into it even more, I believe that they were well into captivity. It is believed that they were in captivity for up to 70 years. So they were well into their, their regrets, well into their shame, well into their bondage, well into their grieving. This was long suffering. And so they sat at the river and they wept. The people of God, they wept. They wept over the death of so many loved ones. They wept over the loss of almost everything that they owned. They wept over the destroyed city, the city of Jerusalem and the temple, the temple that they would go to to worship God, the temple that they built to worship God was destroyed, it was ruined. They wept over the cruelty of their circumstance, the cruelty of, of those who had taken them captive. They wept. They wept over the loss of their past, the blessings of their past, what was good and pleasant in their past. They wept over their current captivity, over their present. And they wept over, over the bleak nature of their future. They had lost hope, they had lost perspective. And yet the people of God express a resolve to stay faithful to God and faithful to His people, no matter what. And now it's a different time and a different set of circumstances, but I was reflecting upon the last couple of years and it would be totally understandable and acceptable if some of the emotions were the same, if there is weeping, if there is grieving, if you've hung up your instrument 
figuratively speaking upon the willows, it would be understandable. You know, when this pandemic first hit a couple of years ago, I never imagined some of the things that we would have to walk through as individuals and as a church community in the days and the months to come and now edging on years. You know, all of us, all of us have been impacted in various ways by the last couple of years, from fear to sickness, to loneliness, to loss, loss of loved ones, loss of jobs, loss of precious times, precious memories, to tensions and pressures, you know, driving wedges in families and communities, to deep wounds being surfaced, spiritual attacks, cruel media attention. It's been a difficult time and it's been long. It's been long. And so much about the world that we live in feels strange, doesn't it? It feels like foreign land. And I have to tell you, I live in the same neighbourhood. I walk the same streets. I drive the same roads. You know, I browse the same grocery aisles. I do the same, I go to the same church. And yet everything is changed. It's different. And just like the Israelites were pressed in to unfamiliar territory in that time, in many ways, we have also been pressed into strange and foreign territory. So when you have crossed over into that foreign territory, there are things to caution. There's things to caution in the foreign places. Like when you travel, you travel to a new place, a new land. There's things to caution. I think the first thing to caution is that there's a potential to get lost or disoriented. Have you ever become lost in a foreign place? You know, it's excusable that you'd get confused in a foreign land. The likelihood to be in an unfamiliar territory and to become disoriented is real. And so we need to caution ourselves in the unfamiliar places. It is wisdom to recognise the vulnerability. To recognise the vulnerability. We are mere humans. And there are moments, there are times in life where you become vulnerable, more vulnerable than usual. And so we need to recognise the vulnerability to lose your sense of purpose to lose the values that you have built your life upon, lose your sense of of direction, lose the virtues that define you, that you have, um, you know, those virtues that that cause you to um, treat others well. We need to recognise the vulnerability that we could get confused about our beliefs, that we could get disoriented from the truth. You know, I have been amazed to watch people, people I love, people that I'm friends with develop distorted beliefs, twisted perceptions. There is a real and valid potential to get lost in the foreign places. And not only are we in a foreign land, but darkness plagues the earth. And that only adds to the lack of visibility. The enemy would have a field day in a foreign land that is dark. I was thinking of Psalm 119 verse 105 where it says, Lord, Your Lord, Your Word is a lamp for my feet, a light to my path. Thank God for His Word. I think the other thing to caution in the foreign place is that there's potential to misunderstand or be misunderstood. Have you ever been in a foreign land where you don't speak the language? I mean, it's excusable that misunderstanding takes place if you're in a land that speaks a certain language, a language you're unfamiliar with. And I have seen it time and time again, over and over again in this strange and foreign place, misunderstanding the the rhetoric, misunderstanding the intent, misunderstanding the decisions made by others, misunderstanding someone's pain, misunderstanding someone's anger. It happens in the foreign land, in the foreign place. And so the people of God, the Israelites, 
They're on the riverbanks of Babylon and they're weeping. And they have hung up their instruments upon the willows, upon their sadness. They're being laughed at, mocked at, uh, mocked by the godless. And they're crying out, how, how can we go on singing the Lord's song in this strange and foreign land? You know, to their credit, how is the right question? Because side note, we underestimate the how, don't we? We place a lot of value on the what. We put a lot of emphasis on the, the why behind the what. But the reality for all of us is that both the what and the why, as vital as they are, can sadly be lost on the how. So much good heart, good intent is lost when we don't get the how right. Our how has never been more important. Manner is important. The methods we choose are important. The words that we choose are important. The tone of voice that we use is important. Because as a disciple of Jesus, I know the what. I know the assignment. I know the purpose. I know the great commission. I get the why. The why isn't lost on me. That the lost would come to find Jesus. That we would be reconciled back to the Father. I know the what, I get the why. But the question is, how Lord, how? Because both the what and the why can be lost on the how. How, given a changing world, a changing landscape? How, in an emerging generation that speaks a whole new language? It's a good question, isn't it? How, my God, do we sing this song? How do we sing Your song, Lord Jesus, in this foreign land, in this unfamiliar territory? How do we respond to the many needs and cries upon the earth? What a great question. And of course, the answer is so simple. It's by being Christ-like. To be like Jesus. You know, we need a resolve to remain Christ-like. It needs to be a resolve to stay steadfast in our pursuit to be like Jesus. We need a humility that is Christ-like, a manner that is Christ-like. You know, my mum says, she says this to our staff, she says it to our team, when it comes to our culture, if it is not Christ-like, it's not our culture. So the how is to be loving and kind and compassionate like Jesus, to be peaceful and peacemaking, to be bold and courageous in the face of opposition, to be wise in all of our choices and actions and deeds, to be quick to listen and slow to speak and merciful with one another, to be gracious and forgiving and able to let go of offences, to be full of faith and faithful to the cause of Christ, to be humble and gentle and meek, to live a life of generosity and to be servant-hearted, to be truthful and honest and righteous and patient and self-controlled and to be filled with the Spirit and confident and excellent in spirit and to be pastoral and caring and friendly and to be healed and whole and hopeful and abounding in joy. Because these are not just attributes to acquire to be a good person. It's not about just being a good person. It's our life's goal and our one main objective as disciples of Jesus to learn and practice His ways. And we don't just get to pick and choose char characteristics that suit us. Everything about who Jesus is, is intrinsically woven 
and purposeful. It's about living in such a manner that's like a mirror that reflects the glory of Christ Jesus. And the beauty of this is, is this, encountering His presence changes everything for us because His presence reveals Him. And when we see Him, we are attracted to His beauty. And just by encountering His presence, we become like Him. So walking with Him, talking to Him, worshipping Him is opening up our eyes so that our understanding of who He is is revealing to us and influencing who we should be as Christians. And the reality is the ways of this world are following a trajectory that is sadly sharp-edged and graceless. And so now, now is the time, church, for us to show up with the beauty of a Christ-like manner. So be purposeful with your how. Be careful with how you use your words. Your words are powerful. They have the power to bring life or death. Protect how you use your tone of voice. Guard your ways. Be intentional with your how. Amen. You know, the Bible, the Bible is so cool because um, if we turn over to Jeremiah 29, God, He sends a word to the Israelites. He sends a word to those who are in captivity in Babylon. He's good like that, isn't He? He sends us a word. He wants to equip us for the difficult times. And in Jeremiah, He sends um, some, practical, some practical wisdom that we can learn from. And so I'm gonna take it from uh, verse four. Jeremiah 29, verse four. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse five, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Verse seven, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yet this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you uh, encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So how do we sing the Lord's song in this foreign land? I've got three points for you today. The first one is this. In the foreign land, build houses, plant gardens and produce fruit. In the foreign land, build houses, plant gardens, produce fruit. Verse five, it says, build houses and settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. God instructs the people of God in the middle of the strange and foreign land to build. I don't know about you, but I have had to choose to keep building my life in this strange and foreign land where it's been tempting to wanna to take a seat. I have had to choose to keep building. I am so glad that we sung Cornerstone this morning. I love that song because yes, the times are strange. The land seems foreign, but I have decided even still, I'm gonna take ground here. I'm gonna put a stake in the ground here and claim that this land is mine for the glory of God. And sometimes we need to tap into the authority that we have in Christ and take ownership, even in the strange times. Even here, even still, I'm gonna lay a foundation thanks to the wisdom of Christ and I am going to build brick upon brick 
building my life upon Jesus and His love. And I am gonna make a place of dwelling here, a place of covering here, even while it's strange, even here. I'm gonna dedicate this land as a land of healing, healing of hearts, healing of families, healing of nations in Jesus' Name. Can I hear an Amen? But not only am I gonna build, I'm gonna plant a garden here. I'm gonna create beauty here. Where it's ugly, I'm planting a garden. Where it's hopeless, I'm planting roses. Where there is loss, I'm planting peonies. Where there is humiliation, I'm planting lavender. Where there is contention, I'm planting a garden. Don't switch off. This isn't about flowers. This is about the beauty of Christ being revealed here. This is about the strength and fortitude of Christ's church remaining here and deciding I will not bow down in defeat and be defeated by the circumstances around me. I will not succumb to the torment around me by my disappointments, by the disappointments around me, but instead I will rise up in strength and I will build here and dedicate this land to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in humility, I will plant gardens so I can declare that no one and nothing has the power to steal or take away who I am purposed to be in Christ and like Christ. God's Word, God's Word is sent to us here that this may be a season of building, of planting and fruitfulness. Number two, in the strange and foreign land, make disciples of the generations. Multiply, do not decrease. In verse six, verse six, it says, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Okay, don't worry. My point is not to get married and make babies. <laughs> However, perhaps if, if that's a word for you, whatever. <laughs> no. But this is a time to invest into the younger generations, into sons and daughters so that, so that they may know Christ. May we make disciples of Jesus in this strange and foreign place. You know, um, a few weeks ago as a family, we received some devastating news and it, it really shook us up for a moment. And, um, and I remember just kind of being like that, being like those Israelites on the river, just, just having a moment of grieving and, and weeping and crying out to God. But the beauty of, um, of Jesus is that in this time, I've seen kids surrender their hearts to Jesus. One of my kids um, on that particular, particular week, we were driving and they were in the back seat of, of the car and I was driving and um, one of my kids just called out out of nowhere, Mom, I became a Christian <laughs> and I turned around and I was like, really? Like, when did that happen? How did that happen? And they said, just here in the car. I just asked Jesus to come into my heart. One of my kids got saved. You know, my nieces, my nieces have, um, have gotten baptised, water baptised. I've heard stories of friends, kids finding Jesus. I've seen young people in our youth ministry with a resolve to follow Jesus where other people are turning away from the church. They're pressing in to the church. Now is the time to multiply, not decrease, but invest into the generations that young people would know Christ and follow Him in Jesus' Name. And number three, in the foreign land, seek peace and tend to the welfare of your city. Seek peace and tend to the welfare of your city. 
in verse seven, it says, seek peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I pray that we would be a church that contributes to the welfare of our cities that we would love our neighbours, that we would serve our community, that we would choose to bless with our words and actions and deeds. Not curse, but bless. Bless our land, bless our nation. This is the great sad land of the Holy Spirit. Bless our local areas, bless our households indeed. May we see our nation prosper and do well and may we be a part of that in Jesus' Name. Amen. And the best part about this is, of course, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And this is not just Scripture that we learn as children in Sunday school. This is the truth of God's Word. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfil my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Who's grateful this morning? Who's grateful? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to see your businesses thrive and succeed. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to see your family reunited and reconciled. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, to see your soul prosper and healed. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to see your body healed and made whole. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to see your joy abounding to see you set free from your bondage, to see your children and your children's children blessed and following Christ. When it comes to His plans, He knows them. He knows them, He declares them and they will prosper and they will give you a hope and a future. So church, if I could leave you with this and I'm gonna ask the team to minister to us in a second. I want to encourage you, reclaim your instrument off the willow trees. Where you've hung up your instrument and you've lost your song, reclaim your instrument off your sadness and sing in this land. Sing in the here and now. Worship your God because He is good and He is faithful to His plans. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. You pull my heart from Egypt. You cut the road through sea. From all our chains to endless praise. The story is in you. And when we cross that Jordan, look back to where we've been. From all our chains to endless praise, the story ends in you. You pull my heart from Egypt, you carved the road through sea. From all our chains to endless praise, the story ends in you. And when we cross that Jordan, Look back at where we've been From all our chains to endless praise The story ends in you Yes it does, Lord. Oh, the story ends in you Come on, wherever you are, Jesus. sing out Claim it back, Jesus Sing your praise, sing your praise When we bid our lives upon His love 
and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. Jesus, we're so thankful for You. And we resolve again to build our lives upon You and build our lives upon Your love, Your truth, the sure certainty of who You are. We're grateful for Your Word, Lord. May we be encouraged, filled with courage, filled with hope, filled with confidence, confidence about our future and Your plans that You have for each and every single one of us. And so we look to You, we love You, we worship You and we adore You. And we're thankful that in this strange and foreign land, You are with us. We worship You, Lord. Amen. I just want to pray a prayer for those who are yet to invite Jesus into their hearts as Lord and Saviour. If that's you and you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, you haven't invited the Lord Jesus into your heart, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation and He is seeking you out. And just as it says in, in Jeremiah, if you seek Him with all of your heart, He will be found by you and you will be found by Him because without Him, we are lost. We are disoriented. We are confused. But all we have to do is open up our hearts, invite His presence to live and dwell amongst us. And we're saved. And so if that's you, just right where you are, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank You for who You are and all that You've done for me. Thank You for stretching out Your arms and laying down Your life for me. I am a sinner. I have lost my way. But by Your grace, I am forgiven. I am set free. And so I invite you to become Lord over my life. And I will walk with you. I will walk with you, following you all the days of my life. In Jesus' Name, Amen, Amen, Amen.